Hey everyone, it's Jen. And this is Lindsay. And welcome back to Corpus Delicti, the podcast. We are back with another season. And this time we are discussing cold cases that heat up at the end. And it is now officially case closed. Yes, so excited to be back. I know we've been off for a really long time. So before we dive into this, a few really quick things. If you are a Patreon supporter, you probably already saw this, but if you have not, we're making some changes to our $10 tier, which is exciting because we're going to be sending out a quarterly gift and we're leaving that term loose just because it could change. It could be a a mug or a notebook, don't know, couldn't even be something not Corpus Delicti related. We don't really know yet. And, And just bear with us as we work that out just because we do have some overseas Patreon supporters. So we want to just kind of feel out, you know, the best way to do that. The other thing is we had said before we went on break that we were refunding the month of December. All of that has been processed except for if you are a yearly subscriber. Reason being, you can't do a partial refund on those. And if we refund the whole thing, it takes away all of your access. So we're trying to figure out how to approach that. It may be that we, you know, send you guys some goodies or maybe, you know, I don't know. We're still working that out. But just wanted to let you know that we did run into that hurdle, but we are working on that. So I think that's it. All right, guys. So we are going to jump right in into this week's case. After a certain point, a killer might think they've just honestly gotten away with it. On this episode, we're going to talk about one of the coldest cases that stayed cold for a very, very long time. In fact, it was 57 years. Irene Garza was a second grade teacher at Thigpen Elementary in McAllen, Texas, and she taught less fortunate students and really, really loved her job. And she had a really, really big heart for these underserved children. In fact, when she got this teaching job at first, she spent her first paycheck on clothes and books for these kids. Irene was born in 1934 to Nicholas and Josephina, and they were entrepreneurs who became quite successful. They owned a dry cleaning business, which they built up over time, and they were able to move the family to a more affluent part of the city in McAllen. This is the 60s. There was definitely some racism at that time. And in McAllen, they were about five miles from the border. So there was a heavy Hispanic presence. And they had the proverbial train tracks that you think of where the train tracks divided the town. So on one side was the quote unquote white part of town. And that was the more affluent part. And then on the other side of the train tracks was where the heavier Hispanic presence was. And that was where her family ended up moving. In high school, she was a little shy, but Irene was a twirler and head drum majorette. She was actually the first Latina to do either. So huge kudos, huge accomplishment there. And in college, she was homecoming queen. And then in 1958, she was crowned Miss All South Texas Sweetheart. She was the first person in her family to actually go to college. Not only was Irene physically gorgeous, but she was a beautiful personality as well. She was described as being kind and she had a big heart for others. Irene was also a devout Catholic and attended Mass daily. This wasn't something anyone made her do. This was just something that she felt compelled to do. Her faith was incredibly important to her, and it was an important factor in who she dated as well. Now, the town as a whole was very Catholic, and it was very much ingrained into the community, which is why it's so important in this story. So in April of 1960, Irene is teaching school, as we said, and she's living with her parents. She's 24 years old, and she had recently been elected as the secretary of her PTA. So we're going to cut to Saturday, April 16th of 1960, and Irene is going to go to Mass, as she always does, at Sacred Heart Church in McAllen, Texas, and the next day was Easter Sunday. So this is a big service. It's a big time of year for the Catholic community. And she borrowed her parents' car around 6.30 that evening. Not too long before that, she had called the church and asked to talk to a priest. And she was 
organizing an Easter egg hunt for the kids at the church, so she was calling to see if someone was there that she could go over the plans with. At least that's what the family assumed that the call was about since she was planning it. And when she called, she talked to Father John Fight at the church. So, unfortunately, the night goes on. Irene Garza does not return home. At first, her parents are thinking, you know what, maybe she ended up staying for midnight mass. Maybe she was delayed or whatever, and she stayed for midnight mass. So they waited for a little while. But by 3 a.m., she still was not home. And this was unlike Irene. So they contacted police to report her missing. So, of course, they know that she was going to the church, so they start there. And at the church, many people saw her. She was wearing one of those white lace veils because, again, it was Easter weekend. And quite frankly, she stood out. She's absolutely gorgeous. So we know she was at the church. And some people said that men would go to this church specifically just to see her because, again, she's a beauty queen, basically. She's a pageant winner. She's gorgeous. So people saw her walking into the church right around 7 o'clock. That does line up because we know she left home shortly after 6.30. And others say that they saw her waiting outside around 8 o'clock. And that is the last time that anyone can remember seeing her. The next day, some disturbing clues were found. For one, the car that she had borrowed from her parents was found parked block away from the church. Some say it was still at the church. Also, there was a road outside the church where they found items belonging to Irene. They found a beige high-heeled shoe, and her parents confirmed that is the type of shoes that she was wearing that evening. Also, they found a patent leather handbag that was found about 300 yards from the shoe in a piece of crumpled white lace. These are found by different people. A person who found the bag said it seemed like it had just been tossed out of a car. Irene's driver's license was found inside of the bag. Now, this initiates a massive search, and this includes officers on foot, horseback, air. They called in the National Guard. They questioned ex-boyfriends, whoever they could think of. Actually, a ton of leads came in pretty quickly. She was a wonderful teacher, great personality, and people really wanted to help. One involved a customer at a grill telling a waitress he had killed Irene and the waitress, she was next. However, he later said that he was drunk, he was just goofing around. Then someone saying that they were Irene called the house and said that she had been kidnapped. She was held in a motel in Hildago. Family was obviously optimistic, hoping Irene is okay. Now, the police went there hoping to find her, and it turned out to be one ugly hoax. Who thinks to do that? Who thinks to say there's a missing person? Let me pretend to be them and call the family and say I'm her and I've been kidnapped. We've actually seen that a couple times. Yes, and I just, I will never understand who who does something like that. Unfortunately, five days later on Thursday, police received a call at 740 in the morning The caller had seen a woman's body floating face down in the canal across from the local Sears store. It was Irene. She was fully dressed except for underwear, which was missing, and she was badly bruised with two black eyes. The canal that she was in had washed away any evidence that might have been on her body. Again, this has been several days. And the only clue that was found was a muddy shoe print on the edge of a different canal that was four blocks away from this one. But what made it relevant, and the reason they started looking closer at this area, was that they found a strand of what was determined to be Irene's hair in the shoe print, along with tire tracks and a faint imprint of her petticoat. So they were able to say, you know, this looks like the undergarment underneath her skirt, and it matched. So in other words, what this tells them at this point is that she was most likely dumped at this canal and her body traveled down to the other. The problem is, it had been raining, so the shoe print details were way too faint to use. They could only determine that the shoe size was between a men's size 8 to 11, which is a pretty wide range. That can fit a lot of people. So they do an autopsy, and they found that she had been sexually assaulted, which had occurred while she was unconscious. It was determined that she had been beaten with a hard object and suffocated, not strangled, but suffocated. 
There was no water in her lungs, so she was dead before she was in the canal. And the state of decomposition suggested that she had been dead for slightly fewer than four days. So investigators are like, wait, fewer than four days? She's been missing for five days. So now they're wondering, has she been held captive for a day or so before she was killed? Meanwhile, investigators drain the canal and they find a Kodak slide viewer with a cord. They asked the public if anyone knew anything about it. Father Fight, who was one of the visiting priests at the church, actually comes forward and says it was his, and he had purchased it the summer before. Now remember, he was the one that she had talked to on the phone. They also found candlesticks in the canal that matched the ones that the church had used. They never really did much with these, but the question is, was this the murder weapon? She had wounds on her head but did they match? So now we start to look at Father Fight to find out why his slide viewer and the candlesticks were in the canal. So pivoting for just a second, one reason that people remember seeing Irene at the church that night is because more than one person recalled Father Fight leaving the area a few times. So let's set the scene here. It's the Saturday before Easter. He is a visiting priest in the area. He goes and helps churches out that need help, and he is helping with confession. The confession lines are out the door. They're running four confessionals this night, so there's four priests, and it's busy. Again, it's Easter. So one of these times that people saw Father Fight leaving the area, they saw him leaving with Irene to go into another room, and they noticed it because his line stalled. He wasn't getting people in and out of the confessional. So others, including the more senior priest there that night, recalled that later that night, Father Fight's hands were noticeably scratched up. And he said it looked like fingernail scratches. And there are photos of Father Fight from when they interviewed him the first time, and you can see the scratches on his hands. So through all of this, they were able to determine that Father Fight was indeed the last person to see Irene alive. But Fight says, look, I don't know what happened to her. It really upsets me that I was the last person to see her alive. I don't know what happened. So let's pause again and let's talk a little bit about Father John Fight. He's 27 years old. He just finished seminary training in San Antonio. He grew up in Chicago in a German Catholic household and lived in a very working class neighborhood. He had an uncle, also named John, who was a priest, and his parents really hoped that one of their kids would grow up and also join the priesthood. He was in the McAllen area for a year of pastoral training, which is why he would hop around helping churches that needed help. So he, three other priests, were there that night. He also attended the local college for related classes that helped develop his training. He was described as bright and well-mannered, albeit a little bit aloof and somewhat of a loner. And he had dark hair and wore horn-rimmed glasses, which kind of made him stand out a little bit. Police asked him why he was seen leaving the church with Irene, to which he responds that she had come to discuss a question of conscience, which they had discussed, but he would not disclose. And afterward, he had told her to go to the confessional, except his story changed. Later, it became that he delivered the confessional ceremony in this other room because Irene didn't want other people to overhear this. Now, this would be considered highly inappropriate. Meanwhile, investigators are trying to find more evidence. Fight finds himself in a little bit more trouble, and we're going to find out exactly what that trouble is when we come back from the break. All right, welcome back from the break. When we left off, Father Fight found himself in a little bit of trouble. Maria America Guerra, who went by America, was a local college student who came forward and said about three weeks before Irene disappeared, she was attacked at the Sacred Heart Church in the town nearby. She said that she was kneeling to take communion when a man grabbed her from behind and tried to put a rag over her mouth. She escaped because she bit down so hard on his hand that she drew blood. She described him as having dark hair, horn-rimmed glasses. Now, in her statement, without being prompted, she said she thought it was a priest because of his black pants and he was wearing a tan shirt. She said that he had been sitting alone in the back pew of the church. 
She said he also looked exactly like the man she had seen watching her earlier that day from his car. Now, at 4.30 p.m. on March 23, 1960, America was at her home across the street from Sacred Heart Church in Edinburgh. She went to the outside bathhouse to get cleaned up and noticed the man observing her. He had black hair, horned rimmed glasses, and sat in a blue and white 1956 or 1957 car. Now, she wrote in a statement two weeks later, quote, I saw the same man not long after in the library at Pan American College, but I saw him dressed as a priest, and I was surprised to see him dressed as a priest, as this was the same man I had seen at the police station the minute I saw him, I felt afraid of him. I want to state that the same priest that I have seen at the college and that I saw at the police station in McAllen were the same man who attacked me in church in Edinburgh. I'm positive that he is the same man. And keep in mind, that's where she took classes. So she was a student there, and we know that he was taking classes at the local college as well. So he attacks this girl, and then she sees him in the library later and is like, holy cow, that's the same guy. So Fight was given a polygraph where, naturally, he denied being involved with either woman. However, it showed signs of deception. But as we know, that really doesn't mean a whole lot. So he's questioned again in a more official manner this time, and they're going back to Irene's case. They're questioning him about Irene at this point. Now, let's be clear when they, we say that, you know, they're watching him. He's a suspect at this point. And what we're about to read is from Texas Monthly, but it sums up very well what he said. That Saturday night, he confirmed he had counseled Irene in the Sacred Heart Rectory. He had last seen her, he claimed, when they exited the rectory between 7.15 and 7.20 p.m. Afterward, he had heard confessions for several hours in the sanctuary and had twice returned to the rectory to smoke cigarettes. As he sat in the confessional that night, he had accidentally broken his glasses. He had a nervous habit of playing around with them when he had to listen to parishioners talk for any length of time, he explained. At 10 o'clock, he drove to his residence in the pastoral house of the Oblate Fathers, five miles away in San Juan, to get his other pair. Upon arriving there, he had found that the doors were locked and that he had no key. Because of this, I had to make my entrance through a second-floor balcony, propping up a wooden roadblock or barricade against the side of the house and climbing in in this fashion. And then he, you know, makes the, the climbing motion. While entering the house in this way, I scraped the back of my right hand slightly and the index finger and my middle finger of my left hand more severely on the brick wall. So he's saying, yeah, I went in and out of the church. I was smoking some cigarettes, broke my glasses, went back to the pastoral house where the pastors live, couldn't get in, had to climb the wall, which injured my hands. Were you climbing backwards? Because the wounds were like on the back of his hands. Were you, that doesn't. What? Or was he Superman? Because I it's mean, a brick flat wall. Yes, and he the, the scrapes are on the back of his hand, so I'm not really sure how that is supposed to work. And he never explained how that slide viewer ended up in the canal, but investigators think that this is how Irene was bound and gagged. So they bring up America, and he says, Well, yes, I was at the church that day visiting another priest, and yes, I was in the back row praying with my rosary. And yes, I was in my blue and white four sedan. But I was back at my church at least an hour before the attack happened. In fact, I rang the 530 bell. So they're like, okay, why is your finger injured? Knowing America had bitten her attacker. Oh, well, that was easy because, you know, he caught it in a mimograph machine. In trying to make the stencil ink better, the little finger of my left hand caught between the revolving drum and the frame, breaking the skin and causing a severe bruise. Now, he said that he had asked for a bandage, and it was the day before America was even attacked. So the police were like, okay, let's, let's try to see if we can match up his story and corroborate this. Because if he is indeed at his church, then this is one hell of a coincidence. As it turns out, several people said that he was not back in time to ring the bell and that he was actually wearing clothing similar to what America had described, tan shirt, black pants. 
So they also remembered him coming back to the church and asking for alcohol and a bandage for his finger. Like he said, hey, you know, my church helped me bandage up my finger. But they're like, "Mm, no, that was not the day before America was attacked. It was the same day. And the church secretary named Tilly Sanchez noticed teeth marks. And from Phoenix New Times, she remembers walking in as the church's other secretary was putting iodine on Fight's finger. I didn't just ask Fight what happened to his finger. I asked, who bit your finger? It had teeth marks on it. It was clear as day. Fight said, it isn't a bite. I said, well, it sure looks like a bite. You can see the mouth shape on it. So after telling all this to police, she actually gets a phone call at the church saying, you're next, Tilly. And she said she was certain that it was Fight's voice. They've worked together for a little while now. He's, he's been around for a little bit, and she knows his voice. So another church member, a teenager, Hortensia Gonzalez, she says that she visited Fight that night for confession. And while there, he told her, I need to talk to you after confession, so wait for me. Now, luckily, she thought this was super weird, and she did not, in fact, wait for him, and she went home as planned. They confront him about not being at the church for the 530 bill, and he said, I believe I hurt my case by trying to be too specific and detailed about my doings that afternoon of March 23rd. Frankly, it is just another routine day, and it's very hard to recall my exact whereabouts, actions, or what have you at any exact time. I left the rectory and drove to San Juan, arriving in time to ring the bell for supper or chapel service. I don't know for sure. But that's a big difference. You said it was, you know, the 530 bell, but now you're saying it's, oh, it could have been the one that was way after that, that would not give me an alibi. That's a big difference. It is so hard for you to recall exactly where you were at what time. You know, think back four days ago. What were you doing exactly at 2.53 p.m. in the afternoon? Now, most of us would say, oh, I'm at work or I'm at school. But then sometimes, and some people go, oh, no, wait a minute. That's the day that I took a late lunch. That's the day I had a doctor's appointment. Unless something emotionally big happens, whether it's good, whether it's bad, every day is a routine day. Yeah. But unfortunately, that little discrepancy just annihilated his alibi. So, Oh, yeah. And <laughs> if I got bit, I'm going to remember that day. Or if yeah. I bite someone, I'm going to remember that day. Well, Father Fight also told them at 8 p.m. he had left the church for a short break. He saw Father O'Brien talking to some men outside the church. He went to O'Brien and asked for the keys to the rectory. Others report seeing him come back to the confessional around 8.15. Now, remember, the last time Irene was seen was 8 o'clock waiting outside. Then they ask about the phone call that Irene made to the church. Remember, she called before she went, and he said, and this is also from the Phoenix New Times, a woman was on the line asking to see Father Junius, who was already taking confessions in the church. Fight said he told the woman that Father Junius would be busy until 10.30 p.m., but that he could talk to her if she hurried down to the church. She was a light-complected girl, apparently of Latin American extraction, good-looking. She spoke perfect English. For 10 minutes, she discussed a personal problem of hers with me, the nature of which I do not feel justified in making public since it involved my obligation of professional secrecy as a clergyman and Catholic priest. So then they say, all right, what about the next day? What did Easter look like for you? And he says that the next morning he gave Mass at 9 a.m., Then he asked Fathers Bush and O'Brien if he could use Bush's car to go to San Juan to get his glasses fixed. Remember those glasses that he said he messed up the night before? Fight said he worked on the glasses for five minutes but had no luck. Then he said, I drove straight back to Sacred Heart Church. Then at 12.40 p.m., he asked another priest to drive him back to the pastoral house in San Juan, where he said he stayed until about 4 p.m. Then he returned to Sacred Heart to give 5.30 Mass. Shortly after 7.30 p.m. on Easter, he said he was given a ride back to the pastoral house by Father O'Brien. He immediately realized he had left some things at the church, so he borrowed a car and drove back to the church. So this timeline is all over the place. He's going back and forth from the church to the pastoral house. And let's 
be clear here, he took her to the pastoral house while the other priests were busy with confession, hence all the driving back and forth. That's essentially what happened, although at this point, they don't know that for a fact, but they're like, okay, something is really off here. The night after Irene didn't return home, her parents called the church and wanted to speak to him since he had spoken to her the night before. He said they asked him if he had perhaps said anything which might have upset or disturbed their daughter. Now, Fight said, I can see the parents were very disturbed and upset themselves, so I sent them home as quickly and quietly as possible. Then I picked up my coat, collar, and laundry and headed for home. It was at 9.15 p.m., but I did not go straight home. My talk with the girl's parents had disturbed me. Perhaps I had said something, unintentionally, that might have upset the girl. I was worried and drove aimlessly for a while. Now, to merge the two cases together, America was shown a lineup where she picked out fight. There was another witness who had seen her running from the church and the man chasing her. That person who saw her run picked out fight two in a lineup. This witness was walking past the church 6.20 p.m. She heard screams and she saw a man hurry from the church clutching a white towel and enter another area of the church. She then sees America run out of the church and knock on their rectory door. She asked America what had happened. America went home and reported the incident to police that night. So she reported it the night it happened, but they did not make the connection until later. Now, what's important to note about all of this, the public knows nothing. Remember, 1960s, Catholic town, you just don't badmouth priests. They are treated with the utmost respect. They're basically invincible in this time frame, in this type of town. If there is anything to do with this, they are going to make sure this is lock, key, set. If they accuse a priest of killing, hurting, kidnapping, and they're wrong, you have destroyed the police reputation. Yeah, and you could actually be excommunicated from the church for things like that at that time. I don't know if you can now, but you could be at the time because people were talking about, you know, looking back on this case, how, oh, none of us wanted to say anything because we were Catholic. We went to the church and we didn't want to be kicked out and all that. So at one point, in fact, there was an officer that suggested to other officers, to his superiors, that fight had to be involved. It was the only thing that made sense. And he was yanked off the case. They pulled him. So in light of all this testimony, the DA actually offers Father Fight a deal. And he says, look, if you admit to killing Irene, we're not going to charge you for attacking America. So naturally, he says no. He's like, no, I'm not going to say that, that I killed someone. But the DA is like, look, we'll at least get one of these charges off the plate, and then we can kind of help keep things under wrap if you will at least admit to it. But he is just not going for it. So Father Fight actually gets indicted for the attack on America. But whoops, he is gone. So they go to arrest him, and the others at the church are like, yeah, he left the state. He did eventually come forward, but they're like, why did you flee if, if you're innocent? And he says, look, I just panicked. The stress of the interrogation and all of this got to be too much. Only his lawyer knew where he was. And he said, look, if or when he surrenders, it's going to take him two or three days to get back by train. So wherever he went, it was a train trip. So Father Fike goes on trial for the attack on America. And it ended up a deadlocked jury. So rather than going back through this whole thing again, Father Fight pleaded no contest to aggravated assault. Here is his punishment. A $500 fine. So That's you're it. you're probably like us, a deadlock jury really like this seems incredibly cut and dry, but think about it. We're only talking about America's case here. So all you have is one eyewitness, that person who was walking down the road, which we know is not always reliable. And you know, it's a priest. So they're like, well, who are we going to believe? But so why did they call the secretary? 
the one that says, no, it is a bite mark. We will find out why certain witnesses were not called. By the way, we did not say this at the beginning, and y'all probably are going to want to kill us now, but this is a two-parter. I think we forgot to say that. (laughs) Please forgive us. But here's the other thing. They were trying to keep this under wraps, right? They were like, look, we won't tell anybody about America's case if you just admit to Irene's case and all that. But now the public knows, at least about America. But since he essentially got away with it, deadlock jury, some are like, well, this is basically a witch hunt. They accuse this priest and then they get to trial and they can't find anything on him. He's he's fine. But there were the people who were like, oh, this is a little shady. Something doesn't add up. So you've got kind of a split camp going on. So now, how in the world do they make sure they get him for murder? He's walked once. It has got to be a rock-solid case. So they've got some work to do, since everything is technically circumstantial. In fact, this causes a lot of tension for a while, because the DA specifically wanted DNA. They want witnesses. They want a confession. They want something that they can indict, convict, and sentence. But a lot of people are upset, and they felt like, look, he's been through enough already. It actually became a huge part of the DA campaign platform. And now we're going to get more into the DA later, because he really, really, really didn't want to indict, even though it seems cut and dry. Meanwhile, let's talk about the church. The church doesn't want Father fight around. It's causing potential scandal. It's causing issue. They sent him to a monastery, and this is where the case grows cold. Partly because law enforcement left it up to the church to handle. Father O'Brien, the head of the church at the time, had said that the punishment the church would inflict is going to be far worse than anything else. And again, they didn't have quite enough to go on. So that's as far as it went. So now, Fide is at a monastery, trying to become a monk. And we're going to find out more (laughs) in the next episode. And I cannot believe we forgot to say that at the beginning, but I'm hoping y'all saw on the episode title that it's going to say part one. So please forgive us. But this case actually heavily creeped me out. It's very, it's just... Ew, it's just icky. And again, we'll find out more in the next episode. And just to clarify, when we do two parters, it's so that we have enough time to actually edit the episode. If we were to edit like a 15 page script, which I think this one is, it would take weeks. So that's that's the reason. And in fact, this is one of the longer scripts we've had that's not a three or four parter. This is one of our longer ones. So I kind of fell in the rabbit hole on it. Just a reminder to everyone out there, if you want to hear our episodes ad-free or if you want to join us on Patreon live events that we hold every month for the most part, uh, please feel free to go to patreon.com slash Corpus Delicti. $3 and up will get you on our Discord server. It's an app. You can download it from Google App Store or your Apple Store. And it's just a place where we chat about everything and anything, and especially true crime. Our Discord Patreons get in the know quicker than anybody else because we're chatting so much with them. They pretty much name all of our series now. They give <laughs> us our series names now. Yeah. So this is definitely a listener-driven this podcast. whole Yeah, this whole series idea came from a discussion on Discord. And also, if you are currently on Patreon at the $3 or higher level, and if, to get onto the Discord, you have to link Patreon and Discord. So you go into Patreon and there's a a section where you can link apps to it. And that's how you do it. And we actually have a tutorial up on Patreon. It's one of the more recent posts. You may have to scroll a little bit, but if you need help navigating that, that is on there. But it's a super fun time. Um, We have been off for a while, I know, but uh, just know we have been working on a lot of stuff behind the scenes. A lot of stuff. And a lot of stuff is to come. Yeah. And some of it is potentially big. Some of it could pan out. Some of it could not. Some of it involves Rocky. Just lots of things going on. So just 
you know, wanted to drop a little bit of a teaser there. Uh, And one of them involves maybe us doing a live show. It does. Yes, it definitely does. If you're on Patreon, hopefully you will get part two of this early um, because we're recording back to back and hopefully I can wrap them up relatively quick. But without further ado, we have another episode to record right now. Yeah. And you know what they said to Felicia. Bye. Bye.